Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about the new concepts feature in C20, which is one of the big new features we're expecting. The C20 standard is expected to be approved this month, February 2020, in a meeting in Prague. Meanwhile, while I like to talk about a variety of programming languages, today I will not be spending time on TypeScript structural interfaces, nor on Go interfaces, nor on Rust traits, nor on Swift protocols nor on Haskell type classes, nor on standard ML modules. Instead, I'm going to talk about C20 concepts, as I already said. This is a way to make sure your templates conform to certain expectations. Now, concepts was originally planned for C00x standard, meaning it was supposed to come out before 2010. Uh, and as we notice here in July 2009, it was removed from the plans for that standard. Then it was going to be uh, under the concepts light notion, hopefully easier to get through because of a smaller scope. It was going to be hopefully in C17, but it didn't make that either because people felt it wasn't ready. And finally, though, in 2017, it was added to the draft for C20, and it has remained there since that time. Now, when you're looking for how to use C20, know that there's a variety of compilers out there that have different levels of conformance. And this particular uh, matrix actually is not quite up to date, but it is one place you can come to look at uh, for information on whether your compiler supports C20 features. You might also look at your individual vendors, such as GCC, Clang, or Microsoft. And another great place to come to learn about C++ is the cppreference.com site. You can learn a lot here about how uh, concepts work. And be careful though where you're looking for information. These might not be up to date. This right here is a change I just made to Wikipedia this morning. It was showing old information for how to use concepts in C20. I updated it here to make it compatible with the actual standard being released and the implementations that are out there today. And note also there's a lot of standard concepts built into the C20 standard library. This includes things such as iterators. For instance, there's a formal random access iterator defined now. It used to be they only discussed how to get around your templated types through human language documentation. But now, in the new standard, we can formally say, for example, these are the features that a random access iterator requires, including the ability to randomly access the contents of your collection. Now, for my demo today, I'm going to show how we can use a templated function to calculate the length of a vector in arbitrary dimensions. So this uses the Pythagorean theorem, or Euclidean distance, where if we have a length of size a and a length of size b, then we can calculate the diagonal between the two uh, using the square root of a squared plus b squared. This also works in three dimensions or arbitrary numbers of dimensions. Now, if you're just doing normal geometry, uh, such as computer graphics or games or other such things, you might only care about one, two, or three dimensions. But if you start doing statistics or machine learning, say, in arbitrary numbers of variables, you quickly get to higher dimensionality. So here's the basic outline for our initial demo. I already have some includes and other things around here, including this norm function. Norm means length of a vector. And for vectors, I'm just going to use a standard uh, vector of double. And so for example here I can calculate the length of a 3-4 triangle, meaning the diagonal is going to be 5. We already know the 3-4-5 triangle, right? And here's how it works out. We start out with a sum of 0, and then we add a squared plus b squared, or if we had 3 dimensions, plus c squared, 4 dimensions plus d squared, so on and so forth, and we return the square root when we're done. And before I go on, notice I'm using random access into this vector. That goes along well with general linear algebra operations, although it's strictly not required to calculate the norm. I could have used, just used a forward iterator. Still, anyway. So if we go ahead and run this, we get that the length is 5, as expected. So let's go ahead and make this generic so that this norm function could apply to other types of vectors, such as things that might be more efficient than a standard vector of double, for example. So to help us out, we're going to make this new type called scalar, which is going to make it easy to extract double or float or, what, or whatever happens to be inside of our vectors. So let's go on ahead then and change this to being a template function. And let's go on ahead and put a vec in here. And we're going to get a scalar for whatever vector type out of this. And we can go on ahead and use this here as well. We run it. We should get norm 5 again. Sweet. Let's go ahead and make this a little bit generic also. What happens if we're not using a size t for the size of our vector? We can do this easily as well. We can say 
using size equals uh, decal type vec dot size and now we're generic in size as well cool still good to go so before I move along let's go ahead and prove the point that we also have higher dimensions available here let's make a one two two three Pythagorean quadruple because 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 2 squared is 9. The square root of that is 3. So the length of this three-dimensional vector is going to be 3. Let's go ahead and prove that works. Okay, cool. Now that done, I'm going to make a focused two-dimensional point with float instead of double because that might be more efficient for certain situations. But we still might want to use our generic function here. So actually, let's make it a struct. Point 2. And we'll give it a float x and a float y. This should be much more efficient to work with in large numbers or with lots of math than, for example, center vector of double. And we're going to want to be able to operate and do this norm function either way. Let's go ahead and prepare to do that, although it clearly won't be working quite yet. Let's call this other one b. And it clearly will have to be two-dimensional since it's only a point 0.2. Let's go ahead and call it 3, 4 again. Go back to what the answer is that we expect to see. Now, in order for this to work, we're going to have to have a size operation and an indexing operation. So let's go ahead and add those. Let's go ahead and put in the size. Now, let's make it an int because we can. Let's go ahead and make sure these are constant methods as well. And let's get our indexing operator in here int again because we can returns a float because we have here and if it's index 0 let's get x and if it's index 1 let's get y it's not as robust as it could be but it'll be good enough for our demo I was going to run this and see if we get the thing that we expect when we ask for the norm of our point 2 and it didn't work because I forgot to put const on here good to go now so we have norm A is 3 and norm B is 5. Good. Okay. That's a good start. Now, what happens if we wanted to do something bad? And in this case, we're going to know we're doing bad, but let's say we accidentally made a mistake with templates at some point. Let's go ahead and reset this so we have a clean slate to work with. Let's go ahead and make a vector of string. And let's try to find the norm of that. And you may make mistakes quite easily with your templates without knowing that you've made them. And one of the whole um, infamous things about templates in C++ is you get long error messages. So let's try to run this again. And it says, you can't, what this really says, you can't do a square root of string. But I get more than a screen worth of errors. And they can get much longer than this. If you've coded C++ for a while, you know what I'm talking about. One of the main things that you get out of concepts is the ability to make shorter error messages. Now I've gone ahead and reset the screen over here so we have a blank slate to work with again. And let's go ahead and get ourselves a better error message out of this wrong use of a vector of string here. Let's go ahead and put a requirement, which is what comes along with concepts in C++20. We're going to say it requires that uh, we have a floating point type for our scalar of our vector. If we did this correctly, we can go on ahead and run this, and we get a better error message than before. It fits all in one screen, even at my large font size, for example. So it says, I don't have a floating point uh, scalar, instead of giving all those notions about all the different ways square root might have been used incorrectly. So this is an improved error message, and one of the things we want to be able to get out of using concepts in C++. And meanwhile, let's go on ahead and extract out this concept to a named concept, which can include other things that are required in order for a vector, a mathematical vector to work. Let's go ahead and get rid of this guy and reset the screen again over here. Okay, so let's go and extract this out here. And it'll be another template just like before, only be a template of a concept. We're going to call it floatVec because that works for our current needs. And we're going to go ahead and take this requirement and put it up there and say instead requires float vec vec. So now we have this named concept we can use anywhere to say what's required for a particular type. So let's go ahead and run this. 
and it works just as before, which is good. This allows us to validate that whatever we're using for our float vec actually is one. And notice we can also go ahead and simplify our notation here by just replacing the word type name with the name of our concept. And this still works for us. Now, meanwhile, let's go ahead and say we forgot to implement, say, the size method for our point two. What happens? Oh, so that doesn't remember name size. Well, ideally we actually have this as part of our concept as well. So anytime we're gonna use one of these linear algebra vectors around anywhere, it has additional requirements it needs inside of the concept. So to do this, we'll go in ahead and make this multiple lines. We're gonna add additional constraints on here. We're gonna say requires for any vector, we're gonna have certain requirements that go on top of that. And so, for example, we can say that any float vec has to have a size operation. So we can say vec size is required to be integral. So let's go ahead and see what happens if we do this at this point and run it instead here. We say unsatisfied constraints because we no longer have a size operator down here on our point two. Note also that integral and floating point are standard concepts built into the C++20 standard library. Now if we did go ahead and get our size back again, auto size const int return to, we should go ahead and get this working again. Anyway, that's a demo for today. I hope that this gives you a little bit of initial taste of how concepts work. And I think we'll have a lot of learning in the future to figure out how to use them effectively. It should be fun. Bye, y'all.